Um, the idea behind it was to destroy something useful in order to stimulate demand. Now, in a certain way, that makes sense. Oh, we're helping unemployment, but, we, but you're destroying something useful to do it. And that's perfectly fine with Keynes. He doesn't care. Um, now, you can contrast this to, with the classical and neoclassical economists who uh, concentrate on stimulating supply. And uh, Jean-Baptiste say said uh, inherent in supply is the wherewithal for its own consumption so the, uh, the opposite idea is to make this make it easier to supply the marketplace with things by you know not taxing suppliers to death um, etc et and making a regulatory environment that helps uh, with uh, stimulating supply so the next slide here this is a long quote from Keynes, and as a presenter, I shouldn't be reading long quotes off of, uh, off of a uh, slide, but this one is so important and so key that I think we should, we should read this together. If you understand this quote from uh, Keynes, you will understand Keynesian economics. If the treasury were to fill old bottles with banknotes, bury them at suitable depths with dis in disused coal mines, which are then filled up to the surface with town rubbish, and leave it to private enterprise on well-tried principles of laissez-faire to dig up the notes again, there need be no more unemployment. And with the help of the repercussions, the real income of the community and its capital wealth also would probably become a good deal greater than it is. It would indeed be more sensible to build houses and the like, but if there are political and practical difficulties, the above would be better than nothing. So really, he's advocating just creating work. Um, it, work doesn't have to produce anything useful. And in addition, not only just creating work, but it does nothing useful. It, we're also printing up banknotes. We just create money out of nothing and do nothing useful with it. But hey, it stimulates demand, it stimulates employment. So it's fine. It's fine with us. And if you think about it, this is, this, every politician, almost every politician in the U.S. today, with some notable exceptions, this is the way they think. This, to them, is economics. There, there's no difference to them between Keynesian economics and economics. It's the orthodoxy. That is how they think. This is how they think. For instance, the, and from this logic, you get all kinds of interesting things. Um, I heard Nancy Pelosi in an interview recently bragging about the fact that they have more people on food stamps now than at any other time. She was, very, she was incredibly proud of their accomplishment. And she said that this is a great accomplishment, getting more people on food stamps than any other time, because it's the best stimulus that you could have. Because you, you print up money, and you take it, and you, you just spew it out at the most people all at once, and you create demand. To her, she's a Keynesian econ economic uh, uh, ascribent. What is that the right word? <laughs> And, um, and most of them are on both sides of the aisle, actually. I'm picking on, on, um, on her, but um, even some, a lot of Republicans, too. So um, I'm going to wrap up this idea of, uh, of talking about economics as a philosophy in this slide. Um, th this is my opinion about Keynesian economics. So I think that, the theory, that his theories about stimulating demand um, actually do work in the short term. And this, this is why they lull people, the Keynesian ideas lull people in, especially politicians, because politicians worry about the short term. They're not worried about what's going to happen 10, 20 years from now. They might be a little worried about it, but if they have a list, it's way down here someplace near the floor. Um, they want something that will work in the short term. So this is why we get stuck with all this Keynesian thinking, because it works in the short term. And you can see when they, when they uh, print up a trillion dollars and shove it out into the economy, we do see a, an effect for a little while. But what's questionable is that the Keynesian theories work in the long term, especially when you consider all the side effects. So, 
the, and not only the side effects, but you, you also need to realize that, um, that they work, they don't work in the long term, plus they work for certain groups of people better than other groups. For instance, with the bank no, uh, bearing banknotes example, we actually have an analog to that, in many examples of that in our own economy, um, with the bailouts, the bank bailouts. So, you know, who is digging up all of this money in the disused coal mines? The banks are. They're the most direct, um, the most direct recipients of it. Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, uh, Citibank, you know, the whole rogues gallery, they're the ones, they're behind Keynesian economics 100%. They love it because they're the ones who receive the money first, Wall Street in general. So, after the short uh, introduction to philosophy, um, let's take a tour away from this and instead take a look at the results of the Keynesian orthodoxy in the United States. So remember, in um, the way we were going to look at it, we were going to look at what has been done and what are the results. So now we've come to the what is the results part. Oh, but first, actually, I didn't read this. Henry Hazlitt, he, uh, he was an econom economist uh, in the 40s and around that time. He says the art of economics consists in looking not merely at the immediate, but at the longer effects of act or policy. It consists in tracing the consequences of that policy, not merely for one group, for, but for all groups. So we, a good uh, economic policy shouldn't just work for Citibank. It should work for everybody. Um, and it shouldn't just work to get the next politician elected. It should work 10, 20, 30 years down the line. So now we're going to look at what our present situation is. And since um, Keynesian policies have been around, um, they've been the orthodoxy for about 80 years since the beginning of the Great Depression. Um, we can pretty much pin our present economic situation on Keynesian thinking. Um, so here are the results of that Keynesian thinking. Almost, and we'll talk a little bit more about each of these. There's been almost no average increase in wages for 20 years. No real increase in stock values for 20 years. And by real, I mean when you account for inflation. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, unemployment is really at Great Depression levels if you use the same statistical analysis that they used during the Depression. And likewise, in uh, inflation, it, there is, um, there's a, a real danger of inflation, and the inflation numbers are being very heavily massaged before they broadcast them on CNN. And then the most important uh, part of our present situation is the debt. And the reason why the debt is so important is because it may, as we'll see later, it, it causes the danger of an economic collapse, of a monetary collapse, of the dollar becoming worth less and less and possibly becoming worth nothing over time. And um, so before uh, I get into the, the next uh, slides, let's just take a look at what is each citizen's share of the debt? So if you can include every child in the country, each citizen's share of the debt is $51,000. So that's kind of crazy. A two-year-old owes $51,000 to the uh, U.S. government. Um, but that's, that's, not, that's peanuts compared to the next one. So should we really be considering every citizen when you think about the debt? Um, I think that it makes more sense to think of every taxpayer because who's going to pay this back? You know, the two-year-old isn't going to pay it back. Well, maybe later they will. Um, but the people who are paying taxes are the ones who will pay it back. So let's consider every taxpayer. And then additionally, we shouldn't just talk about the cash debt, what we owe today. We also need to talk about what has been promised to people in the United States. So you have all of the Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There have been a tremendous amount of unfunded liabilities, which are promises. Uh, they're not yet cash debt, but they're promises. So if you look at each taxpayer's share of unfunded liabilities, it's over a million dollars. 
So, you know, who here pay, pays taxes? Does anybody pay taxes? So, you owe the government a million dollars, and so do you, and so do you. We are the ones, the ones who pay taxes. We're uh, who will pay it back, or so they think. Um, so here's an interesting chart. We've got, um, there's been very little income rise in the last 20 years. So this is the median household income. So you take the whole household. Um, and uh, right here, I don't think my, yeah, the pointer doesn't really work too well. Can you see it? Yeah, I see it. Oh, there we go. Okay, so right here is 1990. And um, it's $48,123 for the median household income. 20 years later, over here, 2010, it's a little over $49,000. So you think, yeah, a little less than $1,500 change in 20 years. Boy, that's pretty bad, but boy, at least it's an increase. At least we got something, right? But no, we didn't. The chart's not adjusted for inflation. As everybody knows, every year, the dollars are worth less and less and less. And so in 20 years, the median household income has gone down in real terms. So it's even worse than the chart shows us. Stock market gains versus real money. So normally when you look at a stock chart, if you go to finance.yahoo.com, and you say, you know, give me an, a chart of the S&P 500 for the last 20 years. What will it show you? It'll show you in dollar terms where the S&P 500 was back in 1982, uh, 1992 um, versus where it is now. And that's the normal way of looking at it. But there's a problem with that. What, what is the yardstick we're using? The yardstick we're using is the U.S. dollar. And again, as everybody knows, the dollar's value is changing with time. It's going down. And so this is, I like the way Joe put this. Um, it, it's like if you take a yardstick and you measure something, and then you cut it in half, and you measure something else and say, well, this is my new yardstick here. It, you're, the, the yardstick is changing. It, the, it's, uh, we're not measuring the same as, as uh, over here as we were over there. I don't know what somebody's house would look like if you kept doing that. Uh, nothing would be straight. And nothing is straight in our financial system either. And so um, you want to look for a different yardstick other than the dollar which uh, to, to measure stock market gains. So this right here is the uh, um, S&P 500 in terms of gold. So basically, right here, I don't know if you can see that. One, can you all see this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK, um, so this is a one-to-one -one relationship. So if the S&P 500 had a one-to-one -one relationship with gold, that would mean, say, the S&P 500 was at $1,500. And gold was at $1,500. That's a one-to-one -one relationship. Um, say the S&P 500 was at $3,000 and gold was at Fifteen hundred. That'd be a two-to-one relationship, which is there we go, right there. And um, so you can see, starting down here, it was a little bit. Uh, in 1992, it was a little bit over one-to-one. -one. Was it way up during the dot-com boom? Down a little bit and wandered around. Then the real estate bust happened. And went way down here. <coughs> and right now, uh, as of this month, we're at 0 0.83. So. It's come up a little bit on this chart since the chart was made, so we're right about there right now. And so this is the stock market gains in terms of real money. Not very impressive, is it? And uh, in case you think from the last slide, oh yeah, well, measuring stock market gains to gold, yeah, that doesn't really have anything to do with our real economy in you know, 2012. That's, people used to use gold, nobody uses it anymore. Who cares? Well. You need to look at this slide. This slide shows us that gold actually does correspond very closely to our economy. So what we have here is we have in the red, uh, the uh, red line is the U.S. adjusted monetary base in billions of dollars. The uh, blue or purple line, whatever that is, 
is the gold price. And they're superimposed on each other. On the right side scale, that's the price of gold. The left side is, um, is the monetary base. And so anybody who claims that gold has nothing to do with our economy today is, is just plain wrong. They haven't looked at the data. Here's the data. So we can see that down here the uh, monetary base, how much money is in circulation in the US is just waffling around here pretty much the same, pretty much the same. And then boom, it starts going up and up and up and up. And now we're way up here. Well, look at what gold did at the very same time. Gold is just, all it's doing is going up with the amount of money that's been printed. And so it's very important to realize gold does have, correspond to, to our economy today. Here's another problem we've got right now. It's depression like unemployment. And this is really shocking. People don't realize what's going on. So during the Great Depression, unemployed, unemployment varied from 8.9%. Um, to up to a high of 24.9 percent, and and everybody's you know you listen to the talking heads you know on CNBC and CNN and Fox whatever, and they're they're like well you know our unemployment's kind of high it's near eight percent but thank God it's not like the Great Depression we're so much better than that at least you know they've saved the.